Hello, uh, good afternoon, or good morning, and welcome to the 2018 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. And welcome to the Bill James Room, presented by the Action Network. Uh, my name is Corey Brumberg, so I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan. It's my pleasure to introduce this panel, Take That for Data, Basketball Analytics. Our panelists today are Zach Lowe, senior writer for ESPN, Mike Zarin, Assistant General Manager of the Boston Celtics, Daryl Morey, uh, General Manager of the Houston Rockets, and Jalen Rose, analyst from ESPN. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, Jalen. Uh, CP time. <laughs> the panel today will be moderated by Nick Wright, uh, co-host of First Things First on Fox Sports. Uh, the panel will be 40 minutes, and we'll leave about five minutes at the end for questions. If you have any questions, please submit them on Twitter using the hashtag TakeThatForData with number four. And with that, I'll pass along to Nick. Well, they'll show it up. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm just going to start with the guy directly on my left, Daryl Morey, and about Houston Rockets and the style. Do, is there any, do, obviously, everyone in this room knows, everyone on the panel knows the value of the three versus the two. Is there any concern, any obligation to the sport at large that <laughs> if, if that style becomes and the math becomes so overwhelming that you the different styles of play go away. Everyone's shooting 100 threes a game. And what it does to just the visceral and visual enjoyment of the sport, or are you just concerned what's the best way we can win the title? Yeah, I'm definitely just concerned about the best way to win. So I don't, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I care. I love basketball. I obviously played basketball. That was my sport in high school. So I love the game, so I do care about the game. But my job is to win. It, 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 my obligation doesn't really go much beyond that. And people who say there's a whole bunch of difference, really, really all that's happened, like there's still beautiful drives to the hoop. There's still a lot of ball movement. There's still a lot of body movement. There's, you know, there's more open. The, the, the talent of the players with more space uh, makes the game more interesting. And honestly, in terms of style, really all that we've done and other teams have done is is told people on shots they were going to take from the perimeter, just just walk back a few feet. That I mean, other than that, well, you still have all the beautiful parts of the game. I think we also talked about this yesterday. Some that like NBA viewership is at an all-time high. I think at a certain point, if it for some reason the style of play got annoying to people and they stopped watching, you know, the league would make changes as a whole. But it doesn't seem like people are very annoyed at uh, the way the league is going right now. I think it's already annoying to some people, but I think all of those people are 40 and up. I don't think, I, I don't, and I'm 40 and up, it doesn't really annoy me, but I, I do like, I do hear people in our, in our newsroom, people in our editorial meetings like, oh, you should write again how there are too many threes. Again, there are too many threes. I'm like, I already wrote that story and there's more threes coming, but I don't think young people seem to care. I think it's not shooting the three, it's who's shooting the three. And the Golden State Warriors, to me, were the first team as a jump shot shooting team that predominantly relied on the three-point shot to actually win the championship. But who was shooting the ball? The Splash Brothers, Steph, Clay. you add KD. The same with Daryl and his terrific team this year. James Harden, Eric Gordon, Ryan Anderson. These guys are terrific three-point shooters. It, the dynamic is a little bit off sometimes when they're players, and not picking on certain players, but like, for example, Josh Smith. He wasn't <laughs> cut to be the type of player to be shooting six threes per game. That's just not his game. But when you watch the Warriors play, Sean Livingston doesn't shoot threes because he's not a three-point shooter. Well, do so, you, go, go ahead, I'm go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. Do you, the, you mentioned Sean Livingston, and I think it's interesting, because I don't, not to Sean specifically, but just as a, maybe a microcosm for it. I, when we hear about Trey Young, we are like, oh, this is gonna be the next wave of guys. Guys trying, grew up watching Steph, trying to be Steph. If there is a wave of guys trying to play that style of basketball, unless the league expands, you still only have, what, 12 times 30, 360 or 50, you know, 450 roster spots at most. There, if there are more guys like with that style, there will be some other guys who used to have spots in the league, certainly when you were playing, that don't anymore. The, whether that be the big power forward or whomever it is. People say the center's going away. I don't know if that's really the truth, but the Charles Oakley type seems to be going away. Like, do you... 
Do, do you see guys that played when you were playing, which wasn't a super long time ago, that in today's NBA maybe don't have a place for them? Not necessarily, because the one thing about the league, only 4,000 people have been fortunate enough to play in an NBA game. And it's a boutique league. And while we call it a three-point shooting league, there are guys that play in the league on a nightly basis that don't shoot a lot of threes. We just had uh, Minnesota last night um, playing against Houston. They have a couple of players that shoot threes, but they have players that mix it up, play mid-range and post up. And this idea that the center is extinct, that's inaccurate. The center is as vibrant right now as it's ever been. It's just a type of center. I like to call it a will big, somebody that's not going to get post ups, somebody that's not a playmaker, like a Capella, um, Steven Adams, DeAndre Jordan. Then you have a Nurkic, you have a, a, a Jokic, Boogie, Anthony Davis. Carl Anthony Towns. So there, there are multiple bigs, but you are your skill set. And then you have a guy like Draymond Green, who's 6'7", that plays center. I think it's the single skill guys. So you, you used to be able to be an absolute elite rebounder or an absolute uh, defender, but not do much else and make it in the league. And the evolution of the league is that that's going to make you either too easy to guard uh, or have a hole on your defensive side of the ball. I do think those single skill, and that's a good thing. You want more skill on the floor for the game. So to Mike's point, I think all these evolutions of the game have made the game more interesting to watch. Uh, most people don't want to watch just a single skill guy who's, who's just out there doing one thing. But as the game, a point Zach's made a lot in his writing is the game's gotten smarter. And as the game gets smarter and more front offices are run by guys similar to Mike and Daryl, if everyone has, or if a lot of the league has the same objectives, it's harder to make trades. It's, if everyone is valuing, deciding, oh, first round picks are valuable, or this skill set is valuable, it's harder to find teams to be able to make viable trades. Are, have you guys seen over the last few years that the ability to win a trade, so to speak, has the degree of difficulty has gone up because teams are putting value on similar things. Well, no one's trading with Mike again after their, <laughs> after their Brooklyn trade, so. We've done some trades since then. <clears throat> um, I, you know, it's a pretty illiquid market, right? You don't, this is, there aren't just infinite number of people to trade with, and they're all in very different, uh, particularly cap situations. Um, so uh, I, I think, you know, it, it probably was the case that you could find more bargains by finding undervalued players uh, in the past than you can now. But I don't think the ability to make a trade has really gone down very much because you know, you'll make a trade with a team that is in a different position from you. They, um, you, know, you, you, see, you see trades like the one between Utah and Sacramento and Cleveland at the deadline where those, those three teams just have different objectives from each other right now. Um, and so well, even Sacramento if they, has an objective? That's what that's uh, called? <laughs> So some of their people are here somewhere. Hang up the phone, Sacramento. <laughs> Why are you helping them? I'm sorry, please continue. No, go ahead. This is just as long as they don't have one next year, it's okay. Um, the, uh, the, um, the Celtics have Sacramento's pick next year. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Of maybe, course they maybe. do. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. The Lakers could still do some stuff for us. We'll see. Um, but uh, I, I just think, I think you'll always have that. You'll always have the situation where teams are in, in different spots and they may value the players exactly the same, but it makes sense to move them. Yeah, the franchise might be in a different situation even if they value the same. One's rebuilding, one's trying to win, right? So that still happens. But one of the fundamental issues that we haven't been able to bridge very well in the NBA is it's very hard. Like if there's one team values a guy here, the other team values him here, and one's pushing a trade, it's hard to get it done. The only way to make that up is draft picks. And to me, they're like, they're like cigarettes in prison. They're like, the value, <laughs> that's the only currency you have. The value changes up and down all the time, and it's, it's, it makes for a not very liquid market. We've talked in the past, and I know Deepak from Harvard's here, if the league office, and we've talked about this, would allow us to make trades like, hey, we'll make this trade, and then if that player plays well, you have to send us another pick. Or if he gets hurt, you know, you don't have to send us something later. That would bridge some of these value gaps and make trades easier. What is the league office response to that 
Too complicated. There's been some resistance to that because keeping track of all the conditions yeah. would be complicated. And then, like, which conditions do you allow? Can it be player-based? Can it be team-based? What what conditions would be allowable? So that it's been Go ahead. difficult to define it. You were about to say something. Like that. No, no, it, it got me in trouble. Well, all right, well, I, this I don't know if this will. <laughs> we can talk maybe in the abstract, league office-wise. As people that are running teams, people that cover the game, do you? Is there? the wish that there was more flexibility or maybe forward thinking from the league office on things as far as, hey, we're going to trade you cap space for a year. You know what I mean? We're going to, we're going to, right now we're in, re we're, we're Philadelphia from a few years ago. Not to pick on Philadelphia now because they're, but we, we don't want to spend to the cap anyway. You are the, whoever it is, the Cleveland Cavaliers two years ago. You are trying to win right now. We will trade you 20 million of cap space for this one season for a first round pick. Both teams would be happy with that. No sport allows it. Is that even being discussed? Do you find that interesting? Is it dumb of me to even bring up? Like, go. No, it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic idea. It essentially happens, but they make, you know, they, it's complicated because you have to do it through multiple player transactions when if you could just simply trade the cap space. So Guys would, in our uh, office have had this <coughs> idea where the, the lottery ping pong balls are actually tradable. And if you use an exception, that would cost you a certain number of ping pong balls. And then you could just, the lottery would be an auction. Well, it wouldn't be an auction. You could decide how many ping pong balls to put in the lottery every year. So, if so you, that would become the currency instead of second round picks. Right. It would be draft odds plus cap exceptions somehow in one currency. So what you're saying when you but say. That's a pretty crazy, I mean, there you got to get the union. Of, I mean, there's all kinds of. That, that would be a drastic change to the league. But when you say the lottery ping pong balls, so if you right now under the current system have the worst record, I know it's changing, you're going to have a 25% chance to get the number one pick. And that's how, call that 100 ping pong balls. I know it's not. What you're saying is where you it's could... 250, actually. 250, okay, perfect. There's 1,000. So, so you could then say, we'll trade you 50 of our 250. Therefore, you get you now have a 5% chance. Like, things that, that far along. Zach, you... That's Go ahead. That's too much work for the league office. It's too much work. You're making these guys work too hard. It's, it's, I thought I so, so teams many can, of them. Teams can effectively trade their cap space now, right? I mean, like <laughs> Vale McGee into salary space is essentially trading cap space. I thought the teams should have been able to trade their amnesty provisions when the amnesty provision was a thing. I thought if like we don't want to use it, we'll trade. You, we'll give you an extra amnesty provision, and you give us something. I think I don't see why not. I do think though we become prisoners of the moment. Like every once in a while, you hear someone say. <clears throat> Wouldn't it be cool if the Stepien rule didn't exist? If teams could just trade like infinite first round picks, we can do whatever we want to. It enables that, that would be cool. And then, and then you make a trade, <laughs> but then you make a trade like How you many made. You, <laughs> you make a trade like you made with Brooklyn, and you have a team that's just like, oh, this is why the Stepien rule exists. Not that they violate it, but like we don't want a team, particularly in a big market, who's just in jail for five years, six years, whatever it ends up being. That's that that does seem bad for the league somehow. So, I mean, these rules are des all designed for a reason, right? Well, I, a a theoretically. They, they yeah. aggregate over years into uh, the set that we have. So, Jalen, I don't know if you read your Twitter mentions. I, th I think I've seen you interact with people, so you probably have people tweet to you similarly to me, uh, just on a larger scale. And one of the things that I'm... <laughs> I, uh, I get... Listen, I'm a numbers guy. I, I love the analytics, but I can get aggravated with people that look at it as like gospel as opposed to part of the picture. I have a guy, God bless him, who sends me Fred Van Vliet, who's having an outstanding year and a good story. You talked about him the other day, Zach, but sends me Fred Van Vliet's per 36. Like, per, this guy is on a Hall of Fame pace per 36. I, the, 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 there are certain analytical numbers that I feel are great and some that totally misrepresent what we're actually seeing. As a guy that has embraced the numbers, but also the only guy up here that played the game at a high at a high level, how do you? I mean, Daryl played. You didn't I have to play. add that. Um, uh, how do you meld what you're seeing with what the numbers are telling you? And are there any particular stats or numbers that you think are really instructive, and some you don't care about at all? I think initially, when the analytics wave came, it swung the pendulum so far that. It went over a lot of people's heads initially. And people who looked at analytics as the stat sheet initially got offended. And now I think it's kind of found its way back into a happy medium somewhat. Because I don't look at analytics as the only tool to measure a player. But I do think it is a healthy tool 
to help measure a player. It's like I'm the founder of a charter high school. So I pay attention to a student's test scores. To me, that's your skill. But your GPA is your will. Mm -hmm. So the stats that really matter to me, I'm not a big Her 36 fan. I'm not a big uh, plus minus fan because those can kind of be navigated by the coaching, by who you're in the lineup with and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. But there are certain stats that matter. And when I hear that teams are measuring how fast a player changes into the floor or how fast they're able to get from side to side with the cut, like these are things that weren't discussed before that are true metrics if a player is slowing down. It, 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 is, it, it is a barometer. But ultimately the thing that you can't measure is somebody's will, somebody's intangible, somebody's heart, and their commitment to what you hope to get accomplished. But I'm not a person that frowns upon analytics, but I do think it's a tool, but not the toolbox. Can I just stick with Jalen for one second, just real quick on a follow up there. Do you feel like sometimes the analytical community dismisses the former players as, as if the experience you gained from actually knowing what the body language is, knowing the intangible things from being in the locker room, th dismisses that too out of hand? Here's what I think players feel like they got dismissed. It's almost a pyramid of information. So like on the ground floor, you have all of these players in, a, in an NBA, in an NFL that's, you know, 75% African-American. So the, they're the bottom of the pyramid. They're smart enough to play. They're smart enough to chime in on their opinions, but we're going to pay you a salary. And then as you get higher up the pyramid, the diversity gets a lot smaller. So it gets a lot smaller from coaches, then GMs, then presidents. And before you know, it's ownership. And so what has happened is players feel, and it's actual a fact because it is taking place, that because I'm able to speak the owner's language, which is numbers, that now gives me the upper hand to get the job. And if you look at what has happened in the NBA, the former players, for example, that have that wealth of knowledge of playing their entire lives, maybe working in the media, and now studying the game, they feel like, and it's true in a lot of cases, they've been boxed out of these power positions, general manager, president, and ownership. And Zach, this is why people respect your writing so much, I believe, is because you do a better job than, in my opinion, anyone that writes about any sport of melding the two, of someone who clearly understands the numbers deeply, but also you watch as much basketball as anybody. You, you're not just watching the biggest games between the biggest teams. You, you, have, a, you have a grid or something you've discussed about. You've got to make a very, sure. It's a very complex system. <laughs> right. It's very complicated. Uh, but, but, you, but you've been able to. So what do you do when uh, some numbers that you typically think are reliable, you see it and you're like, that is not match up with what I think I'm seeing. That does not match up at all with when I watch this team play. Uh, first of all, can I go back to something you said? Before? Please, sorry. I think the per 36 stuff is important. Like, you talked about finding undervalued players. That's the low-hanging fruit of finding undervalued players. And, the, and, like, patient zero of that, at least in the modern NBA, was Paul Millsap. And, like, it turned out that Paul Millsap's per 36 numbers carried over when you started playing him 36 minutes. And then people studied that, and they studied other players like that. Like, a lot of those guys actually carried those numbers over or carried 80% of them over or 90%. Like, that's still... Like, that's still important to me. And, and the, I, think, I think, like, it's not, it's not necessarily fluky. The counter, the counter to that, though, is it doesn't take into account foul trouble or fatigue. Sure. And absolutely. so if a guy's play, like, I think per 36 can be super useful for guys playing 30 to 38 minutes to normalize it. Guys playing nine minutes a night, we don't know, could he, who's, could he sustain that? Well, that's what you have to watch yeah. the game. Right? It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't factor in. There are certain players that a coach says, I want to get him on the floor, but he can only guard certain guys. And so I'm going to wait until there's a matchup on the floor where I say, okay, I can put him out there because that guy's big enough and slow enough. He can guard him, and then we can get his shooting on the floor. That kind of an argument. Now, to your other question, I mean, part of it is, is you just, when you see it, you, you have to see, what is this guy doing that I'm missing, or what is he not doing that I'm missing? And that's just watching the game. But I think that the stat right now that is, has everyone um, a little bit confused is, is our real plus-minus stat, because it sometimes spits stuff out, like Jay Crowder is the 12th best player in the NBA, 
or Tyus Jones is 19th or something at real plus minus. And then you have to... <laughs> you see, I said I don't like the plus no, no. minus. But, yeah. but, just, but, yeah. but that's real plus minus. Well, that accounts for teammates. That accounts for opponents on the floor. That Theoretically. And so you got to start asking questions about, like, okay, so what lineups is Tyus Jones playing in? Who is he playing against? Why is it? What is he doing that works? What if that carries over? Or, is that stat meaningful at all? And I, I'm still struggling with it now. Or it's a regression analysis, and you know that one out of every 20 players is going to be really poorly valued by something that has a or certain what you confidence said. interval. But, I mean, it's but, just like there's different kinds of stats, right? So th this is exactly when things might be the most valuable is you watch something because we're all good at watching basketball. So if you're if you're well, some of us are good at watching basketball. I don't know if I am, but I think I am. Um, if you're watching something and it disagrees with some other process you have that tells you something about what you're watching, and they disagree, one of them's probably wrong. And so you got to go look inside the real plus minus black box and say, all right, is this working the way it's supposed I'm, to I'm be too working? Scared. Or not? I'm not going well, to open that box. But. Or are you watching something that's, you know, is the way you're watching not capturing something that this black box over here is capturing? One of those two things isn't right if they're disagreeing. Um, or maybe there's some third truth, but probably not. The other thing so, to no, watch with real plus minus uh, is some players, and, and I think we named a few, they, they are playing a role that provides a lot of value to the team. Uh, shooting's mm -hmm. probably the easy, easiest example. They provide shooting to the team, and because they are on the floor providing that shooting and the spacing, real plus minus is gonna pick up that the team is winning a lot when that player's on the floor, but that player could be very replaceable by multiple players with that same skill set such that it's pro even though it's correct that they're creating that winning in our roles of having to decide, decide player to player uh, you have to think about how else can you fill that role uh, do you necessarily not have to pay for that player or are they not providing as much value as it says yeah. correct and that's where I was going with the plus minus it's a perfect example of why all numbers can be manipulated <laughs> it's, it's like a nickname like once somebody calls you something, then you start telling them different reasons why you have the nickname. <laughs> and it's the exact same thing with the numbers. He just mentioned it. If a player is out there for floor spacing and he's playing with the Houston Rockets and they're beating teams by 20, you could put anybody in that spot and still have that same plus minus number. But to Daryl's point, you want to try to make that a cap friendly number based on what you hope to get accomplished. Well, and so I, I look in the crowd, and directly in front of me is a future Hall of Famer named Chris Bosch. And if you, and people say I say your last name wrong, Chris Bosch. I say Bosch. I apologize. I got it right that time. <laughs> uh, but so. He's good with it. That, but so the year 2013, I think it was, when the Heat had a 27 game winning streak, there were a lot of players in the league who, according to player efficiency rating, according to points per game, a lot of metrics were having better seasons than Chris was. But there weren't five players in the league that you could replace Chris with and that team would be as good. Be given a lot, some of those were tangibles as far as floor spacing and defense. Some of those were intangibles as far as a future Hall of Famer saying, I know my role, I'm gonna play my role. And I wonder if at times when we, we were in such a dark ages in all sports for a long time, when it was just what the scouts see, what I, you know, what the eye test, if we swung it too far the other way to where we aren't, and you got criticized for this, not necessarily appreciating the chemistry aspect as much as it needed to be, and things that where the guys in the locker room know what, that they can't win a title. You, it, maybe Blake Griffin that year had better numbers, but they wouldn't have won the title with him. And so the, how, how you do those things and who you rely on to talk to from pl a player perspective, a coach perspective, how do you do that math? Well, I'm glad Chris is here because we tried to give him hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and he's finally agreed to something I asked him to do. Uh, I would say, with, I would say that plus minus, uh, I would, Chris and our pursuit of him was really, of course it was based on the numbers, because but you didn't need it. He, he's a Hall of Fame level player, but we thought he was actually quite better than people realized. And it was because of our scouting. It wasn't because of our analysis. We thought he was perfectly where the big position was going in the league and that he was a highly, and the way he talked in the last panel about how Spo used him, he was a highly mobile big, who I think is still to this day super underrated defensively. Uh, he 
he was able to basically, he was like to me, well, LeBron's amazing, but he was the linchpin to that D as much as LeBron in that from the big spot, he was so mobile and plugged so many gaps. Everyone saw he was a good offensive player. Everyone saw the other things. That was why we were sort of obsessed with our pursuit and, uh, and you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe next time. <laughs> I, I also think Howard. That, the thing that's happened, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the thing that's happened that's sort of, highly, highly mobile, maybe. Uh, Let Mike the, the thing that's happened that's, that sort of changed that dialogue, though, inside teams is we have these tracking cameras now, right? So we spend so much more time talking about each attribute of a player's game now than we used to. So the, the kinds of numbers you're talking about where someone's, you know, eight spots better up in terms of overall impact than another guy. Um, that's in the context of his team, like everyone was just saying. You're going to move to a different team when we're looking to acquire a guy. We got to think about the skills you're going to be using when you're on our team. And they may not be the same skills. And so the beauty of having the cameras is now we say, OK, here are the things we think this guy's going to do on our team. How has he done those things? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you can break it down by skill so you don't have to be reliant on some big black box number, you can actually say, all right, the computer went and watched his you know, 500 left side pick and rolls. Um, and when they went under, he was pretty good. Uh, you, you can do stuff like that. And, and it just makes analyzing what's going to happen when you engage in a transaction so much easier than relying on some number where you don't really know all of the things that are packed inside. Yeah, big composite number. Yeah, you can come specific. close now to quantifying Lots of stuff that people still say is, oh, you can't quantify that. You can't like you can almost quanti you can quantify some parts of effort. You could certainly quantify the stuff you're talking about. Like you know, you just got Greg Monroe. Like Greg Monroe is going to play differently for you than he played for other teams. Like let's see how he did though. Like you Zach, can do how all would of you that. quantify effort? Huh? How would you quantify effort? Well, you would start by doing you know one, once the like you have the cameras who can track how fast people move and you know. Let's talk about that. So all else equal, everyone would say you know. Moving more is better than moving less. Not necessarily, but like. Oh no. Okay. So how are you measuring? So you don't want to. Well, you can measure. Okay. People have already written papers about like. Well, to like, I guess yes, but like, who gets back on defense least? You know. Yeah. Um, There's a future for you as a law school professor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and soon the cameras, soon the cameras, I I bet would be able to pick up like. Who's standing up on defense? Who's in a stance most? Who has their arms out the most? Like so that will come next. you would think more movement is better than less, but if you look at the data on who moves the most and the least in the league, the list of the t people that move the least are literally every Hall of Famer. They're just more, you know, our guy's one of the guys who moves the least. Like, they're more efficient in their movements. Like, they can beat their guy so easy that they don't need to they don't need to do a lot sure, yeah, but you can compare him to what he did before but and see if he's trying harder or less hard yeah you can look at momentum and things jalen you're doing everything but saying amen so uh, <laughs> <laughs> well a couple of things um so so again like stats can be misleading like for example steals you could be leading the league in steals but that also could probably mean you gamble a lot and so people will say, well, such and such had three or four steals, but they don't understand that like, he gambled eight or nine more times and gave up open shots or caused help situations. Same for blocks. Yeah, you're going after certain blocks. Yeah, you blocked three, but you went after 10, and your man got seven offensive rebounds and put them back in. What about the number of times you kept the guy in front of you when he came off a screen? Yes. That's you like can, a, you, can do that. you can do that now. Yes. And That's, so... Right, so some of them are useful. Right, and, 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 and I, I was shaking my head to Daryl's point, like, great players are moving on the basketball floor like a symphony, like playing chess. Mm -hmm. Average players are moving like checkers. They're the ones that are like, moving around hectic and frantic. The, easy, the best players, they make it look effortless. So, so we have a question from Twitter, which kind of goes in line with, what I was maybe trying to get to in the beginning, which is people ask me, why is basketball, why is the NBA my favorite league, why is basketball my favorite sport? And it's because... Who's your favorite player? What? Who's, Who's your favorite player? All the Houston Rockets, Daryl. <laughs> um, and, uh, oh, you wanted me to say LeBron? Yeah. I'm a weird guy. The greatest player ever is my favorite player, but neither here nor there. Um, so, but why do I love the NBA so much more than the other sports? Because y'all are some superheroes. 
because what because I'm watching guys do things that human beings should not be able to do that's why I love it and so the question from Twitter is is athleticism the thing that really attracted me to the game as a kid becoming less important now because so much of it is about range shooting than it was before in your eyes I think it's oh, more no. important yeah okay yeah. defensively you have no chance to guard the modern offenses unless you have like athletes probably at all five you try and hide some non-athletes now but but you you need long athletes at all five spots now I, I think it's more important you're not getting off threes unless you have someone who can get by their guy and get to the rim otherwise they just stand out by the point line with you. it depends how you define athleticism too right like like uh, there was Stroh Miles Swift athleticism, but he didn't know how to play. Ty Thomas. And then, like, there's there's Draymond Green athleticism, which is which is maybe not as like vertically noticeable, but is very noticeable. Then there's like Kyle Korver athleticism, which is like if you like I I wrote put this in a column once. Like he made a three from the corner this year in Orlando, where he was so far in the corner he was essentially out of bounds, and he lofted it like it came this close to hitting the backboard and switched. Like, that's athleticism, too. Like, right, a different kind of athleticism. While that is amazingly impressive and Corver's one of the greatest shooters ever, that is, that kind of speaks to the issue. I think some, like, that type of athleticism, you recognize that you appreciated it. That is not, and say what you want about Stroh Swift, that's not Duncan from the free throw line. Well, this and, I'm is not, the and I'm not making a value judgment. I'm just saying from a, oh, my God, what did I just see moment, it's easier to recognize for, I think, the average sure. fan, a top 10 play than the core. And, and that's, that's the sort of like the poster guy for that right now is, is Blake Griffin, who's had to go <laughs> learn how to shoot threes at like almost an average rate and spends a ton of time out on the perimeter because he's playing with DJ and then Andre Drummond. And it's not the Blake Griffin that we all fell in love with. And like, if Blake, if Blake Griffin can't shoot threes and he's, he's not as valuable a player as he as he was 10 years ago or five years ago. Well, football dominated the popularity landscape for so very long, but those days are over. And based on the um, Twitter question, I can probably name 50 reasons why. Um, number one, the popularity of the sport. Look at a player like LeBron James, for example, just on his social media. He probably has, what, 40 million people following him. That's probably more than all of the top NFL players put together. Aaron Rodgers, J.J. Watt, Tom Brady, Odell Beckham. It, it, it's not even a comparison. The other thing is that the NBA players have a healthy respect and admiration for their commissioner, where you see in the NFL there's been a lot of disrespect towards their commissioner. Um, the NFL has other issues, opioids, um, steroids, concussions, um, things that the NBA doesn't necessarily have to deal with. Um, also, for the NBA, each player has value. And you guys were talking about having, like, long athletic players and things of that nature. I've talked about this for years. Like, growing up, being a 6A player, idolizing Magic Johnson, there was a time in a high school game where I would play point guard. There was a time in a championship game where I would jump center. And so, like, that's where the game is now. And so, as a fan, you can appreciate each person's role out there on the floor Versus if you're watching a football game, you're normally only watching the ball and only talking about the quarterback or the receiver or who's transporting the ball. And the so. league's going to get more athletic because to Jalen's point, we're, gonna, we're winning the war for talent. If you're a young, elite athlete that has a choice between sport, it's not close. You're going to get paid most money. You're going to have the long, nearly the longest career of any sport. It's, it's not close, like, which one you're going to well, choose. Well, and if you just look at the next generation, some of these guys are already this generation, where they're from. Giannis is from Greece. Embiid's from Cameroon. Chris Stapps is from Latvia. Like, you, you literally can pull global. If you have your talent base is the entire world, aside from Antarctica, and Kyrie says Antarctica doesn't exist. So you don't even have to worry about it. It's, it's, um, it's just really long and thin. Yeah. I thought it, he's the edge it of the world. Edge of the world. It's, it's it's the world. Shell. Yeah. If you guys were at home right now, we could have had Kyrie come to the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. It's the first and, year there hasn't been a game during the conference. Sorry, that's a conspiracy. And, and, and you didn't want to expose Kyrie <laughs> to the data crowd. And, 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 and that's my point exactly. Like, the, the growth of the NBA is astronomical because there's a, a, an influx consistently of international prospects. Yes. That and doesn't they, take place in the NFL. The no. top players the in NFL the NFL is hoping to find American born player. players. Sorry, Jim. Right. No, if you look at the NFL, th there's one path to the NFL. 
American college football, except for one player every three or four years that comes either as an Australian rugby player or a European soccer player. And, and those guys are just kickers, usually. Like, there's one path there. Um, and so, no, the, for the long-term health of the league, there's no question about it. Yeah. it one, another Twitter question oh, is, does the data you use to evaluate players, what's wrong, Zach? Mean, I, I don't know. Okay. No. Does the data you use to evaluate players change regular season to postseason? We spend so much more time analyzing a player. Don't hesitate, yes. No, we spend so much <laughs> there, more there time. There are players that play well in practice. Yeah. There are players that play well in the regular season. <laughs> then there are players that perform in the playoffs. But you also just do different things for the playoffs because you're not going to, if you got five games and seven nights against you know, five different opponents in four different cities, mm -hmm. you're not going to change stuff up every night. But for the playoffs, it's two weeks. So you're going to look at a lot of stuff you don't spend time looking at during the regular season. We do weeks. it. Two weeks? What's two weeks? A series. A, a series. series. Oh, a series. You're just expecting them all to be sweeps? No, no, no. no. <laughs> <coughs> oh, I thought you were saying our playoffs are two weeks. I was like, no, I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, obviously postseason performance is super critical. It's really difficult to know how much weight to put on it. Uh, a lot of players haven't had a chance to play a lot in the playoffs. So you're looking at a limited data set. Um, and the opponents are better. The opponents are better. You can look at their, I mean, generally most players get worse against better opponents. You have the very unique players that Jalen talks about. They're, again, the superstars of the league who often play better because they're bored during the regular season or for whatever reason. But, but yeah, it's, it's difficult to use that data even though it's critical. So the, there's right now something really interesting is going on in the league, which is the two highest scoring teams, the Rockets and the Warriors, the two most efficient offenses. Two of, I think right now, Houston is the single most efficient offense in the history of the sport, and Golden State is top ten in the history of the sport. And by the way, those numbers are not skewed just recently. Like the rest of the top five outside of Houston, it's the 88 Lakers, the 87 Celtics, the 92 Bulls. Like, so it's some of the all-time teams. But the Warriors are a near all-time record-setting assist rate. You guys, meanwhile, are bottom of the league right now in uh, number of passes per game, in a, near the bottom in assist rate. So two totally different approaches are yielding almost the exact same result, which is like 116 per 100 possessions. Mm -hmm. how, what does that say about, about the, not the way the league is going, but how you can score points in how the league? I think it's great for the league because everyone says like, oh, they're the same, and you point out very clearly it's not. I mean, we, we score extremely efficiently. Uh, it's not even early in the clock. People are like, oh, they... They score so early in the clock, but no, I mean, you know, both James and Chris, they're not running it up the floor. We pass ahead a lot, but generally we, we get a scoring opportunity off our first action, and if not our first, it's our, it's our second. And, uh, and, and yeah, it's super efficient. It's very different than a ton of, and it's a lot of pick and roll. It's different than a ton of ball body movement like, like Golden State, but I think it's healthy for the game that there are different ways to create a winning offense and there are very very different ways to create a winning defense well i would be interested to hear from you like when your team started running so many isolation plays right i think you lead the league in isolation you're on pace to be the most efficient isolation team ever but you know the data on those plays says isolation plays are bad so when you started trending that way were you ever like uh oh this is going to be damaging or were you like james and chris are just so good doesn't matter again we take what the defense gives us so like you know teams are basically saying we can't guard the pick and roll any other way but but switching and which puts us in isolation and yes thank goodness we might have the greatest iso player in nba history in james harden and chris paul is pretty darn good um no the data would say no he, I'm, I'm, I'm listen i'm not i'm not <laughs> arguing with you i like greatest in nba history conversation but it's yeah, not for this yeah moment. yeah so um. I, I know that usually always ends in one guy <laughs> for you but, but uh but yeah, so uh, and if teams guard us one way, we take what's there. And what's the nice thing is, and Mike is such a genius at making sure that no matter how we're guarded, we're going to get to a good answer against them. And people say, and uh, rightfully so, Daryl and the Rockets hate the mid-range shot. Well, they do until Chris Paul gets there, and he's one of the greatest mid-range shooters ever. So now all of a sudden, the mid-range shot's fine. Like there's you, you. Well, and later in the game, when you're up or in key moments, like, you know. 
you just need a point. You don't need right. a three. Uh, you know. Well, I'm gonna show my A. Get my Arnold Horshack on. What's up? Show you a lot of y'all don't know who that <laughs> That's is. That's too old of a reference. I know who Arnold Horshack is. No, anyway, man. welcome back, Carter. Ooh, ooh, ooh. But anyway, um, <laughs> here, here's here's really what it is. The, the dynamics of how you play is based on the skill set of your best players. And Daryl's best players, Chris Paul and James Harden, he just mentioned, are terrific in isolation with people's switch, pick, and roll. And when he said James Harden is the best isolation player in the league that we've seen, that's not far off. No. He's one of the most unique players the game has had. Not many people have led the league in total points and total assists. I know Tiny Archibald did it in the same season, which is just crazy. But, like, only four people have ever done that. So when you have James and you have CP, you have to let them ISO. You got to let them cook. Versus in Golden State, their best players are able to play without the ball because Steph is considered one of the greatest shooters of all time. But that's catch and shoot. That's off pick and roll. That's in half court. That's in full court. Oh, and by the way, they added KD. Right. And they have Clay. So based on that dynamic, they can thump it faster without having a, a high usage rate off the bounce. So, and that's what makes those two teams um, so much different, but yet so much the same. So when we do, because there's a Twitter question here about how many of the top 100 players of all time would be playing right now if you don't adjust for era. And so with the, the context for the question, like Bob Cousy is in everyone's top 50 all time, but Bob Cousy could not get a Division One scholarship today. No, we're not going to do that. Oh, okay. No, well, I'm, no, I'm going to do that. No. Go watch no, the tape. I no. his head down. I shot know he set was, shot. but there are going to be people in 25 <laughs> years no. looking at these players doing of the course. exact same no, that's, thing. No, that's my point, is you have to adjust for era when you're doing a fair to what they did. But if we are simply saying the best human beings to ever walk the earth at the skill of basketball, like, are we talking 75 of them are playing right now? Uh, the 75 of the 100, like, Jalen's shaking his head. No. But in the time sports, Jalen, because we know this with, with swimming, with track and field, like, Jesse Owens wouldn't qualify for the Olympics now because the athletes get bigger, stronger, faster. Right. What so, if he had had modern training techniques but we don't, then? Of, of course, but that's, but right. that's why I'm saying that's why we isolate for era. But Europe, I'm going to start with you, Daryl. Uh, <laughs> why not? Um... um how many? I mean, I can just Elijah Wan, Mark Price would still be playing. I mean, I just you guys. I, those are Daryl's like two favorite players. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna well, say Mikhail, right? Like, yeah. His... Well, Mikhail. No, of course he would. He would. He's a Hall of Famer. But yeah, it, yeah. But it's not a huge. I. It's not a. <laughs> man, it's not a big list. I'd really like to see Kevin Mikhail, Hall of Famer, guard Chris Bosh. I'd love it. I'd like to enjoy seeing it. So, hold on. I'd like to see Chris Bosh guard yeah, Kevin no, McHale. So, so, no you, offense, you, Chris. You don't think <laughs> Kevin McHale can do what Clint Capella's doing? What? No. Are you out of your mind? I, 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 <laughs> no, I don't. Here, here, here's, here's what I mean by that. How much Kevin McHale did here, here, you watch? Man, pl plenty of Kevin McHale. Go ahead. Sorry. I don't want to. Uh, Kevin's a good Here's guy. what I mean by that. Play small ball center. That's really all he's doing. Yeah, but you do when that. You, get up yeah, you don't think court. Kevin McHale could play small ball center? In a slow, slow pace. All, <laughs> all, all play. Carl Anthony Towns isn't fast. Yeah, I think Carl Anthony Towns. Never mind. I don't want to make this about Kevin McHale. I, the, the, <laughs> uh, but, 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 the, but, but that's, but that's my point. Like the, the eras conversation is always going to benefit the current player. I'm not going to look at Dennis Smith doing a 360 in the game and say, Dominique never did that, so he's better than Dominique at jumping and dunking in the game. It's just they have more technology and they have more things going for them in the, in the current landscape. Zach, when you are watching every team across the league, how much has the amount of effort and energy... Because what we hear all the time is they don't play defense anymore. Back in the because back in the eighties, you, you only hear that from college them. basketball fans who don't watch. The okay, NBA sure. Or well, very gonna, old people. I, I, right. right. I want to let you elaborate. The level of effort that it takes to be just a competent in a NBA defense from guys off the ball, the movement, the things like that, compared to how the game was not in the fifties, but I'm talking about in the eighties, even early nineties. All you have to do is go watch a game from like the finals in the eighties, and it's like everybody is jammed. 18 feet and into the rim and so it's it's just the sheer amount of forget the complexity of the rule changes and all that but just the sheer amount of space you have to cover is much different now but that's that's partly rule changes and partly a more sophisticated understanding that like three is way more than two 
And but yeah, I, I think I think it is. It's it's. There's definitely more physical demand. I the think. defense has gotten so much more complicated, even in the time we've been in the league. I, I mean, there's just it's so much more intricate. The game looked different ten years ago yeah. than and, it does and now. It can like be, a lot. It can be frustrating. It's one of the reasons why Jalen is so good on TV. Is it, it is it is frustrating at times when the people who can set the narratives are players who, of course, say it was always better in their era, it was always harder in their era, as opposed to recognizing, like with everything, people get better, people get faster, people get smarter, people adapt more. It wouldn't make sense that in professional basketball is the one thing where it was better 30 years ago. Well, so. back in the day, players trained. Back in the day, players worked out. Players nowadays, they train. Back in like, the day, Tommy Heinsohn was selling insurance during the summer. Right, smoking cigarettes at halftime. Mm -hmm. so, so now you have to keep up with the best players. If you want to compete against LeBron James, you have to do what he's doing. And so those are the two biggest misconceptions about the NBA, that players don't play defense and teams don't pass. In 24 seconds, that ball gets hopping when you're watching some of the best teams. You may see seven, eight, nine passes in 24 seconds, which is terrific. I just don't know how anyone with a brain and functioning eyes can watch an NBA game for more than five minutes and say any, any of those things. I just, don't, I, just don't under, I just don't understand. Nostalgia is a hell of a drug, man. Like, that's, <laughs> that's part of it. All right, it's, unfortunately, it says we're out of time. I want to thank Daryl Morey, not only for originating this conference, but for being on the panel. Thank you, Daryl. Mike Zarin, assistant GM of the Boston Celtics. Zach Lowe, the best sports writer in the world. And Jalen Rose. And Chris Boss, just because I talked about him.